Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us again for another fantastic episode of Breakthrough Real Estate Investing Podcast. Uh, as usual, here with me again is Mr. Sandy McKay. How are you? Doing fantastic. Um, yeah, excited uh, excited for another great show. How you doing? How's your summer, man? We're closing out July right now. I know. It's uh, been fantastic. It's been busy and like this is one of the busiest summers I've seen in years. I don't know if you're seeing the same in Costa Rica. Canadians, uh, you know, first summer back doing events and whatnot. It's been been fun, and also it's flying by. Now, are you talking business wise or just you know activity wise? Getting out there and being able to do stuff. Mm, getting out there to do stuff. Both. Business yeah. is is uh, is is great, and also like odd, like a bit odd right now because the market's slowing down quite a lot, right? So we see mm-hmm. a lot of. Uh, a lot of interesting things happening. Amazing market to be buying properties in and to be um, going against the grain of everyone else and buying when others are fearful, right? The, the classic, uh, I guess it's a Warren Buffett line. Be greedy when others are fearful, fearful when others are greedy. There's not many greedy people out there right now. So <laughs> it's the time to get greedy. I like it. I like it. Um, okay, as usual, you guys know, go over to our website, breakthroughreipodcast.ca. Uh, there you can, of course, listen to all of the past shows. You can hook up with the guests if you need to, because most of the time, at least, uh, their contacts are in the show notes. So if there's somebody that you were particularly interested in, want to reach out to them, you can do that. Just go over to the show notes at uh, our website, BreakthroughREIPodcast.ca, and you can pick up our free gift. The free gift, the ultimate strategy for building wealth through real estate, and you will, of course, get that when you uh, jump on there and subscribe and uh, never miss out on the show. Get updates through uh, everything else that we're doing. And um, yeah, go do it. I think people under underestimate uh, what you might find when you uh, subscribe there and learn about all the events we're doing and get a lot more chances to engage with us. So yeah, go do that. Very cool. And of course, go over, leave us a rating review on iTunes. Helps us out a lot. Um, you know, it doesn't take long just to go over. Let us know what you'd like to see on the show too. Like when you do the review, say, hey, you know, I haven't heard much of, I don't know, whatever topic it is that you would like to hear of. Or, or if you have a guest suggestion, please like feel free to, uh, uh, you know, leave us some, leave us a little bit of advice because we always like to hear what you guys want to know more about. So go over there to iTunes and uh, let us know what you think. Absolutely. Absolutely. We always need more recommendations. We've been going eight years. We've got a lot of contents. Um, I know there's still, you know, suggestions that come in every once in a while and we're like, yeah, that's never done that before. Yeah. Um, yeah. There still is. I mean, even today we've talked about basements and stuff and all that before. I think we're probably going to dive a little deeper even than, than most uh, have heard before on this episode with our guests. So, you know, there's always, always, always new things too that are out there that are coming and new different strategies and whatnot. Um, so let us know what you want to hear because we'll go find the experts on that topic and bring them on. Mm-hmm. And uh, today we've got Guy Solomon with us and we're really excited to talk to him. Um, you know, topic near and dear to our hearts, of course, and, and a lot of people that are sort of just getting started in investing, they they tend to, um, I mean, he's done a lot of things, but, it, you know, one of the things sort of that, that uh, Guy focuses on is the basement suites. So we're going to dig into that. And I think it's a topic that a lot of people really like to hear about. Absolutely. So welcome. Yeah, to have him on. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time today. I know we're going to talk about a bunch of things, but uh, of course, you know, the, the um, adding basement suites has been something that uh, has really, really actually helped me a lot in my investing career. So I know that it's something that can help a lot of other people too. So this is a topic that uh, is, is, you know, very important in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've been servicing basements since uh, 2012 and, you know, back then it was not as common to to build legal basement apartments. Most municipalities weren't even legalizing them. Right. Back, I think it was a 2014, I did my first basement apartment for a client, which was very like purposeful. They had, um, the, the, the grandfather is actually quite sick and he wanted to leave a really good, uh, like living quarters, safe living quarters. There's a generator involved. Like there, there's a lot of detail to be the first project. And then from there, we just kind of focused on that market and it really didn't pick up until probably 2018, 2019, where the real estate prices started to climb. And a lot of people looked at it more as a need, 
to offset the rental, like the, the real estate prices. And then obviously investors follow suit and they're ahead of it too. And we do a lot of uh, basement apartments and duplex conversions and it helps people in their, um, in their burr strategies or whatever it is their strategy is, is, is great rents coming out of the basement. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's driven it a little bit too is the fact that like for a long time, there was certain areas inside every municipality where th that was the only area where you could add legal basement suites. So it had to be zoned a certain way, right? And now they've changed all of that. Um, I believe every municipality pretty much in Ontario, which is you know where you guys are based, has brought out rules to allow secondary suites citywide or municipality wide basically mm -hmm. so it's almost all of ontario where you're allowed to um employ this strategy now which has probably made a drastic difference in your business oh for sure and and we service most markets right we're uh with respect to ontario like we cover the entire greater toronto area kitchener cambridge waterloo hamilton we have showrooms in those areas uh barry we have an office in ottawa so in London, Ontario now. So we're, we're kind of following where the market's going. Obviously, there's less and less new construction for low rise in the GTA. So we go wherever. I mean, we're in Wasega Beach right now. Um, you tell us where and we pretty much go, right? Who's done more basement suites than you in Ontario? I don't know. I, I, from, <laughs> from the stand, like we're all private businesses. So I'm assuming yeah. we're like, the, we've done the most. Uh, maybe private groups have competed, but We've done hundreds. Yeah. I, I thought like Sandy, were you expecting him to know who it was right there and just be like, you know, turn to the side. I expected him to be confidently <laughs> saying, Oh, us for sure, Pango Basement. I mean, we're the <laughs> we're the leader. I, I, I know you've done hundreds of them and I and I also wanted to make sure the audience knows that that we got kind of the the guru of them here with us today and and uh you know, a lot of people, it's great to hear all sorts of different stories on it. I know you've got a unique perspective because you've done so many of them right. um, for yourself and clients and in, and in all these different markets too. So oh, there's yeah. a lot of very variables as you go through different markets and every, you know, there's so many different things to to uh, to think on. So um, yeah, I'm excited to have you on here to, to talk more on, dive deeper on this topic because it's a great one. So how did you get into this? I mean, you mentioned that you did your first uh, legal conversion of a basement mm -hmm. uh, in 2012 so obviously there is steps to being able to uh to take on that challenge so tell us yeah. how you got started well you know i started the company i registered in 2011 started building just regular basements in 2012 uh so personal use spaces i even avoided washrooms when we started just trying to keep it as simple as possible like hey i'll build your basement here's a plumber's business card um but you know my background i have a degree in finance and accounting so I studied in school and um, I, you know, I was raised in the window and door business. So I got to see the ins and outs of process and manufacturing and so on and so forth. So um, I had my own window and door business too. When I was, I, I registered, I started in 20, I was about 24. Um, and I ran that for about two and a half years. And I, and I just saw that, you know, that business was kind of fading with the fact that all the new houses already had vinyl windows as opposed to aluminum and wood replacements. So when I registered Penguin, I saw it as an opportunity to just follow behind the track builders, the subdivision builders, and build all these personal use basements. And then as we move forward and as that Bill 140 came through, um, as you said, all the municipalities came on board. They were more receptive to it. Some were a little bit more or less at the start, but now it's pretty much universal. Um, and yeah, and like you just take it from from process to process. And, you know, Sandy and I have had a few conversations uh, in the past where, you know, if you're committed to continuous improvement, you just take whatever mistakes you made, roll that into a new process and an adjustment and you keep going. And um, just doing that for, you know, the better part of eight years with conversions, like I think it was up until 2018, we weren't even 2019, even we weren't even renovating the main floor because people would ask us for main floor. I'm like, that's not systemized. So, you know, just the way the managers looked at it at Penguin and, 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 and the way that was conveyed is like, let's focus on the basement, let a small contractor work upstairs. And by virtue of seeing that, you know, that the upstairs took longer or they're having a tough time finding contractors or um, even they're getting over, over like all types of terrible experiences. Mm -hmm. We decided that if it's an unoccupied unit, we'll do it. It was just another basement. We'll just we'll sell the basement in its entirety and then we'll treat the main floor like it's change orders. 
and they work with the with the architect or project manager to like table what are we just painting are we replacing some floor you know more bespoke that way so yeah you just got to be flexible and lean and and try to um just solve problems right right and speaking of problems what were some of the challenges that you faced when you were starting out and doing this uh, basement apartments or the whole business uh let's talk basement apartments i sure. think because like you know that's sort of the focus i uh yeah. where a lot of people are going to want to get their information from today i mean yeah we can we can do a whole other um no problem. you know business related uh sure, interview no at some point but i think that that's yeah. really where we should focus today yeah yeah so i mean the first thing is getting a building permit right so come i think the most important thing in a basement apartment is coming up with the right designs i mean i have so many designs that come to us that are done by other architects where They've suggested it can only fit one bedroom. And by I could even in, in our training and the way that we do it, we try to keep the living room and main area the same and still add in a second bedroom by eliminating hallways, by maximizing the flow of space. The most important thing in a basement apartment is coming up with the most efficient design to maximize the potential rents and conveniences. Another trend, for example, is there's a work from home. There's a push to work from home. So a den even if it's going to be a five by seven type of room that is convenient to work within has a lot of value as well. So a two bedroom plus den, um, even three bedroom in some markets, that's really the, to me, that's the most important part of, of the entire process is getting the right, uh, right design in, uh, in terms of challenges that we've had. I mean, it really comes down to the inspectors. I mean, that's the variable. The building code is the building code. The way we build is the way we build. And, you know, certain inspectors want it a certain type of way. So we've noticed that we have uh, sensitivity around the rough inspections. You know, like some of them want, you know, for us to do certain tests around the plumbing. Um, you know, uh, there's different ways to fire block. There's different ways to fire separate, fire caulking. Like, so what we do is we probably on a basement apartment, we we'll probably call for three rough inspections, even if there's only required to be two, including like, walking through the fire separation twice so we don't have to deal with that after we're in the painting process um but once you clear all the rough inspections and everything's cool you're pretty much smooth sailings the job will be done in about two weeks max three weeks you know outstanding there might be some outstanding landscape or something like that but the the critical point in any build including basement apartments is the drywall so we know where we stand once the drywall goes up I guess one of the important things that we should mention here is the whole idea behind <clears throat> why something like this is so important. And I think like there might be uh, some new listeners here who, um, you know, are kind of going, OK, but what's the like real significance of this? And why are we talking about it like it's so important? And I think um, is so at least for Sandy and I, and I think a lot of people who are just starting out, the best way to force appreciation in in some kind of a renovation project and also to keep something for a long-term rental is to add a legal basement apartment. So that's what we're talking about here. And, and it's been one of those strategies that's been super, super powerful. It's the focus of our free gift and um, yeah, that you can get if you go over to breakthroughreipodcast.ca. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, just to buy a regular single family home and then add another rental unit into it, right? So now it's, instead of having one single family home, you've got two two legal rental units. So, and then of course that forces the, 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 the value of the house to go up and you can go back to the bank and say, hey, you know, we've, we've made all these changes. It's now something else. Can you come back? Can you reassess what, uh, what we've got, what we own. And then typically you'll be able to refinance and pull a, a bunch of money out to be able to possibly go and keep on, you know, doing, uh, investing in something else. Right. So at, at least for me, being able to do stuff like this, we've been, I've been doing the, like that same thing for, I don't know, like 10 years now, probably. And it's been so powerful. It's allowed me to get where I am. The strategy and then of course the people along the way that we've met who have been supportive and helped us uh, be able to do it as well but i think that this strategy here is one of the best rob opinion. even rob even um house hacking right like if you're <laughs> if you're not necessarily thinking of it as an investor investment property necessarily but 
you know, it's one of the things right now as we're seeing some of the market shift, their interest rates going up. You mm. know, what are what are some things people can do to lower their costs of living um, at a basement suite, right? Like if you're if you're if you were to add a basement suite suite to your personal residence, whether you're yeah. you know if it's your first time buyer type house, it's a great way to offset that. If it's not your first time buyer house, but you want to get rid of that, you know, great way right now to get rid of the interest rate and that 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 how that affects your lifestyle is go take out maybe a loan on your property and add a basement suite. The, mm-hmm. When you do the math on that, you're probably offsetting that interest rate completely and able to maintain your lifestyle and, you know, yeah. all sorts of variables on. on well, the, I mean, it was one of the <clears throat> one of the major light bulbs, too, just in life in general and what made me kind of, uh, you know, start to look more deeply into the whole real estate investing side of things was one of our first, I think our second place that we bought. Uh, my wife and I was a was a legal two unit place. And then, of course, at the end of the month, we're like, wow, we've actually got a little bit of money left here. You know, has never been the case before. So so, you know, seeing that is one of the light bulbs that kind of makes you go, oh, OK, well, what if we do it again? And what if we do it again? And what if we do it again? Right. Well, How does that look? For sure. What I've what I found with respect to basements is. I asked a simple question with customers, what is a basement really worth? So when I was growing up, the basement was where we played hockey and roller rollerblade or whatever. It's like a, a, a it's like an insulated storage area. Mm-hmm. But when you look at the fact that rents are anywhere from 1500 to 2000 in most markets and sometimes even more, and you put that as a percentage, it, when you put, put that into a mortgage and you see that it could pay 300, 400, 500 thousand dollars of the mortgage depending on what the rent would be, That's truly what the basement could be worth. And that's why whether or not you're using it in a duplex conversion or a primary residence, it helps make everything just a little bit more affordable. Um, And that's it, right? A lot of people just looked at it as storage, but if you can utilize it in some other ways. Another cool thing we do with with that is try to help them understand, like, you didn't have, like, what was, most people, when it comes to a personal use basement, they only want, for the most part, an extra place to watch TV and maybe a washroom. So you right. only need two or 300 square feet to do that, yet you can still utilize the rest of the basement for a one or two bedroom rental, which would obviously pay for the reno and, you know, create some other flexibility. So there's lots of options for people either as individual owners, helping their children get into the market or creating an investment strategy, just understanding, okay, an, an insulated storage room can now is a vehicle, but we have to put a value to what that basement could actually be worth less the cost of construction, obviously. Do you find that most of your clients are the homeowner that's living in the space or are they investors? It's a big mix. It's a big mix. Um, I think that because of the way that Penguin is situated, we deal with a disproportionate amount of like individual owners that want to add uh, rental space to their own dwelling, right? There's a lot of service providers in the design and uh, permitting that don't service end unit homeowners because they're, they take a bit longer to make a decision and, and things like that, but we're built for that. So I would say it's, it's a good mix. I mean, it changes from season to season, month to month, but um, I have never really broken down how many are individual homeowners, but we have a lot. Well, here's a good question for you then. Have you noticed anyone that started out um, as a client who was the homeowner? And then a couple of years later, you've seen them all of a sudden now they're doing two, three, four, or, or, or getting into oh, yeah. it more, you've seen them again, yes. right? Because a light bulb went off for them just from this project. Exactly. So we, you start off with a, in their own residence and we usually advise to start with your own residence because mm-hmm. it's the least, you know, you know, you got to take it in baby steps. It's the least risky. You already own the house. So you spend the money for the reno, you get the cash flow, get refinanced next time your mortgage comes due or just nice and slow, right? You have to take it nice and slow with an individual who's doing it for the first time. But also I've seen people do it uh, as an investment strategy. They're a bit nervous. They bought their first property. And then I see them scale up. I've had customers come back for their four, those individuals, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. It's really cool to see them Mm -hmm. grow their strategy, build confidence. Um, You know, I always encourage them to get, especially if their kids are older, get their kids involved. If they're teenagers, whether it's the demo, whether it's the numbers, I encourage them to be a part of the meeting. I mean, that's what this is really all about. This is a long-term strategy. This is about um, building equity and transferring wealth and transferring the skills that it takes to come to the table is equally as important. So it's you become a part of their their whole lives in some sense. And 
to be honest, that's the part that makes it fun. It's not fun to hear a job is delayed by two weeks or that we have to repaint the wall. Like the human element of this is like, I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's why I still deal with most of the customers myself. What were some of the what were some of the challenges starting out with this uh, this model? Like, what are some of the or what are some of the common challenges that people have, uh, either yourself, you've experienced, or, or or clients that are you know just have come up often or just seem to be things yeah. that are always there. I think you just need to like it's the knowledge of the building code, right? Like ceiling heights, natural light, and how to deal with the inspectors. The mm-hmm. construction is pretty like. You know, once you build, once you do construction, construction is construction, right? Like, I mean, it's a washroom or two, it's a kitchen, it's it's drywall, different variable um, variances in terms of the type of drywall, type of flooring. But that part's not uh, difficult. A lot of people get hung up because of the inspections, right? They don't know that you might have to increase the water lines. You know, you have to deal with fire separation on the furnace room. Like, they just don't know. Uh, and often what they do is they get, if you're talking about individuals or invest, they, they don't know that. You know the quote doesn't include what they what isn't yet in the approved permit set or site conditions so you really the, the biggest key to basements the basement conversion and the duplex conversion is just understanding the building code and understanding what you can um you can convince the inspector that is uh you know a a, a resolution and what you have to come back and redo so you just need to have that experience and i think that we're in a unique position that we service almost all municipalities so we can cross reference. We have engineers on standby to stamp things. Like we can, we have our own in-house structural team. So like we we can submit for revisions and continue with the process. So it's mm-hmm. all about keeping those, keeping the process going and, and getting to final occupancy. We understand the time is ticking and dollars are expensive. Yeah, and I think that that, that relationship with the inspectors is actually one of the most important things because mm-hmm. if you get on the bad side, you know, they, they just start to look at the project a whole different way and they'll give you a hard time. So that's one of the things that I noticed anyways. For sure. Uh, so how, like, is there any other ways that you're helping people uh, invest in real estate? Yeah. I mean, um, for, for the most part, they've been basement apartments um, in the personal use side just touching on that, even for some savvy like builders or investors, we do what's called an FIY. So it's a finish it yourself solution. So we do the bulk of the work and then they could do their flooring, their trim and their paint, right? And miscellaneous carpentry. Um, the thing is we won't do an, a finish it yourself solution for someone who doesn't have a decent knowledge of the building code or has done one themselves before, because we don't want to leave them in a position to deal with inspectors at the final. But for personal use, we do that. So like if you've overstretched your budget and bought a personal use home, great opportunity to pay 50, 60 cents on the dollar and then use your own human uh, time capital to finish it off. But in terms of uh, like investors, obviously the big thing now in Ontario is uh, Bill 108 and the garden suites. And uh, that's something that we've taken to quite seriously as uh, Sandy heard a little bit about, right? So we're, we're looking at different markets as they're coming on board. And it really is reminiscent of when legal basement apartments were coming on board, municipality to municipality. I was going to different meetings and seeing what the bylaws are going to be. And um, you, we really want to be at the forefront of this because to me, the garden suite is the exact same thing as a basement once the shell is waterproof. So the exterior is, you know, we build a basement or put it on, um, on uh, footings or wh- whatever the case may be, however we build the, the structure get it ready and then and then treat it as if it's another another basement or a duplex conversion and now you can you, you can collect three different units rents and the other cool thing about the um the garden suites is they offer it's just a unique product so it's it's better for accessibility mm-hmm. uh, you can design it whichever way you want and uh obviously there, there's certain bylaws you have to stay within but it's probably more similar to how you can build in uh, costa rica than how people are used to building in ontario Right, like a little casita off to the side. We are not stacked on top of each other, right? Because exactly. often, especially you know when you've when you don't have the proper insulation between, which I'm sure has never been a problem for you. But you know, in the past, we've sort of cut corners where we could. You know, there was there was different rules back at certain times. You didn't need to make sure there was a certain amount of insulation in between. There's grandfathering and all this kind of stuff. And then, of course, there's 
sometimes some tension in between the, the tenants because of noise or, you know, thumping on the floor or whatever it is. So with these garden suites, they're the completely separate unit, which is great. Do you find that um, for the most part, the municipalities are allowing that as a third unit or in almost every case, or are they? In the areas that we're focused in, um, so in Toronto, in Hamilton, um, in Kitchener, we found that that to be the case, but you know, it's July, August, uh, 2022. And those bylaws are changing regularly. Mm -hmm. So we, we've even designed certain structures to meet certain bylaw, not realizing they haven't posted the new bylaw. Right. So the, the latest bylaw, uh, for example, in Hamilton is 75 square meters for a structure. And so, you know, I, we had to quickly redo a couple of designs, uh, to still fit, you know, a two bedroom plus den, uh, design, but you know, constraints are fun. You know, if you get, just get a blank footprint, blank canvas, blank budgets, like that's not fun. It's fun to design something to a constraint. Um, that's what we've always done in basements. So we'll work with every municipality as they, you know, uh, onboard their policy and their, uh, they adjust their policy and whatever the case may be. But the, the purpose is the same, whether it's to add more affordable housing to the rental stock or to help people pay off their mortgage or to amalgamate families, you know, like it's it's a great space. But I, I really, really want these garden suites to be, at least in their inception, to be really a, a great option for accessibility. You know, I mean, these are bungalows aren't really that accessible because you still need three, four steps up and tip five in a typical bungalow. I want these to be maybe just the sill and a small, small, small ramp. And this is finally an opportunity for low rise housing to give, um, you know, homers a real alternative. So whether it's aging in place, living in place, or they, you know, they have a slip and fall and they need something, they don't have to always uh, find an alternative that's uh, in a mid rise or a high rise condominium. If that's not what they're used to or comfortable with, we can create an unbelievable like space and, and, um, and make it, you know, have them live with dignity and respect and a great space. Like I, I personally don't need a lot of space. So if you have, you know, 800 square feet inside and it's well designed, it'll feel like a thousand and you have a great garden and so much flexibility to it. So we we're really looking forward to it. So it's such a cool uh, opportunity. Yeah. Interesting one that a lot of people aren't aware of yet either. And especially I love that if you can make them affordable, accessible, efficient, mm -hmm. Those are like three of the key sort yeah. of buzzwords to, to make happen now where everyone loves it. It's a great, it's a you're doing a great thing for the community, adding a lot of like how many people would love to have that. There's so many, your market for uh, who would be interested in that is massive. So you're opening up, you know, on resale or all the different options down the road are huge. Um, yeah. Probably financing probably will, will, will appreciate all those things to some extent, um, you know, so. Mm -hmm. I know CMHC is looking for exactly that: affordability, efficiencies, accessibility. Those are three of their main terms. If if all their different um, options they have out there right now on bigger buildings, those are the three keys. So I think you're nailing you're nailing those. Well, I think I think we our goals should align. I mean, we're all here to serve the community. So whether it's CMHC, of course, a little bit of politics, but the the goals are, should all be the same. We're here to serve people, right? So um, that part is extremely exciting, um, and just. You know, when we when we go to build, we want to be mindful of what the individual is actually looking to for, for like the end use case. Like, what are we going to design for? What is the solve that we didn't solve before and just work through it. But the, the reason that this industry is so now when you buy a house, you can create two rentals, uh, an additional rental. So it creates it creates a, a tremendous opportunity. But this opportunity has been created, in my opinion, because of overregulation. You know, whether it's the land supply, whether it's um, the way that you get permits, like w for, for multiple reasons, labor availability, you know, this is an opportunity for individuals to become mini developers. And when you're looking at some of these like older neighborhoods with larger lots, you know, you take the last 30 or 40 feet off the backyard and you turn it into a garden suite. So the, 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 the let's say for argument's sake, it used to be a 140 foot lot. And now the house is effectively 100 or 90. When you look at any new development project within, let's say, the greater Toronto area, you'll be hard pressed to find a lot that's longer than 90 anyways. So the developers are giving you these products, whether you like it or not, on the main dwelling. 
So you might as well get some of the economics out of out of the garden suite as well. So simply by we can be creating accessible homes, we can create affordable homes, but at the same time, we can give some real power. And, you know, Rob, you mentioned it best. You're like, this is a great, the basement apartments are a great investment vehicle. And the garden suite is even more of an amplifier to getting people on the property ladder or making things more affordable because, you know, the rental, the rent in the garden suite should be, could be as high as 50 or 100% more than the basement, depending on how it's designed and what area it's in. So if you're doing both and you're investing that kind of capital, you're going to have unbelievable results with respect to how it covers the mortgage or how it gets you on the property ladder, and it still services serves the community. So where do you see your business going in the future? I know we're gonna you're going to be doing a lot of that. What, what else is in store? Okay, should I save it for the business part? No, I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, <laughs> Look, at the end of the day, it's it's about housing solutions. So right now we're taking a step past the basements um, because we kind of have it systemized. We feel as if we're past COVID. So we kind of remember our system and our speed and fluidity in 2019 and, and, and the beginning of 2020. So we feel really comfortable. That's why we're growing into this space. We have already have a footprint in most of the geography from a labor standpoint. Uh, but, you know, I want to I want to add to the housing stock, add to the rental properties and accessibility. And then, you know, with with the right partners, explore what else, you know, this province needs. And that can be in multi res that can be in single family homes. Um, Penguin Homes is something that's going to come on the table, likely for 2023. We're in the process of the Terry on application. And, you know, we think that on that front, for example, just the more I th- the more we evaluated the numbers like there's a real opportunity to build some custom homes at roughly the same value of what you're buying a subdivision home for. So it's a very small step. Um, You know, when you look at custom homes as an example, most, if not all of the custom homes are built uh, based on a cost plus approach. It really doesn't, uh, doesn't allow for real negotiations with your sub trades because it's not your cost and the higher the number, essentially you're just getting your margin on that. Um, So, and then there's some some practices with respect to tax, like land transfer twice and HST on the finished solution. You don't see too many spec builders that are finishing the house and then going for sale just with, with all those charges. So we think there's some unique opportunities to help people get out of the subdivision home where they're staring at their own with at their neighbors glass to glass almost and get them uh, into some custom home solutions. But that's what's so great about the garden suite is that at, at scale, we think we can really refine our process and then move in at scale to be a custom home uh, builder, as long as it serves people to get into something that makes a little more sense for them in the short and long term, a little more land. And, um, you know, they're working from home. And so we can offer some new options and new opportunities because you can't wait for these subdivisions to be, you know, approved. And then you're not going to assume at this point that they're ever going to be affordable again. So that creates a tremendous opportunity to kind of break the mold and maybe build something custom. So, you know, there's, there's a long-term horizon of constantly of, of providing some new solutions that uh, will, will, you know, increase options and increase affordability. So my math is very simple. It's continuously producing more housing options and, and solutions and the rest will hopefully uh, solve itself. No, I like what you've done. Uh, I like what you've done as far as that goes, like as far as business goes, you know, learn, grow, learn, grow. I know there's a lot of parallels definitely between, you know, uh, running a business like this and, and uh, you know, running an investment uh, business, you know, real estate investment business. So thanks for sharing, man. I appreciate all that. And that sounds like very exciting for the future. So wish you all the best. Can you uh, can you comment on a little bit of the changes that have happened through COVID and how that's kind of your business, but how that's affected the consumer and how they're working with you as well? Because there's some pretty interesting changes, uh, Guy, I think, that have happened that made your business more efficient and, and better for the consumer. Yeah, I think, I think. oh, you mean like in terms of our, our whole... So operationally. I know you're, yeah. you're, you know, when you, you know, you're... Um, Taxes, or sorry, finance and accounting background always that says to me you, you're pretty detailed oriented and you can probably manage some systems pretty well. And I know you have some yeah. good ones. So, and, so, yeah. and they've evolved to help the consumer in a lot of ways. So, I'd I mean, love to hear I, a little bit no about problem. that. 
if I talk about systems, it could take like a whole uh, day. Uh, brief, so, briefly. Okay. Briefly. So, I mean, the first, the first, I'll try to summarize. Um, first thing is like Penguin at like 2017, 2018, I can't track it, but we had over 50 employees, not on the tools. So it wasn't very productive and it wasn't very um, effective in terms of, you know, getting, getting a job fluidly built and it had to go through all these people and site managers and this, that, and the other. What we're running right now is, you know, I think our mean, a mean and lean strategy, uh, but even saying that it's probably understated. So what we do when we, you know, take on a new client, we send a drafts person out to the house and we do a proper draft and we do a 360 Matterport view in and out of both levels and the exterior. And then we jump on a Zoom call with myself or two others and we come up with the layout. We, we explain our service offering. We do, we com uh, complete the entire scope of work, price it. And usually in that individual meeting, clients tell us yes or no. And that's super, super productive and it's efficient. It's mutually beneficial. Then they meet for an hour with the architect on Zoom. And then they meet with basically the, the designer who helps pick all their finishes and it's all done in one package and they're ready to go. Our process is that architect they met with after the sale is responsible for their project now all the way until we hit boarding. Okay, so drywall. And then the construction manager communicates with the customer and brings it home. Okay. And what happens is we have finishing supers in every market. And so once we get to carpentry and finish paint, they're doing the miscellaneous access panels, maybe, you know, connecting a tap. They're responsible like a PDI, like a builder to get it all done. But essentially, you know, it's all streamlined from point to point where in the office now, you know, in terms of total management and, and staff, we probably have 12 to 14 people and we're doing double the volume. And so the key to that and understanding where all the jobs are at is that our trades, because they're largely in-house or, in, in, or controlled, like the framers, they, we frame most of our basements in one day. And at the end of the day, they'll do a 360 virtual tour. And so we can see what they did at the end of the day. Same thing with the inspections. We virtual tour that. We virtual tour the boarding because we did the backfill for the concrete. So at the end of whether it's four days or six days, I have three uploaded virtual tours where I can see what they did, exactly how it was done, the work orders are in, payments are processed. So, and then we're already, like I said, in the finishing stage, and that's why they speak to the construction manager and he has resources to make it happen. But um, yeah, we've just basically eliminated project managers, traditional site managers, salespeople driving to houses and selling at kitchen tables. We already have the... CAD drawing done before they even engage with us. And then it's really the me and two guys that I've been working with for years. And I, I love like one of my best, one of my favorite parts is working with the two of them to design and, and quote and sell uh, these spaces, which I still do myself as well. So it's super streamlined and it's not, not involving too many hands. And uh, our trades really love it because they're dealing either with me, those two guys, the architect or our construction manager. So it's, you know, they communicate, they use the app, they do their uploads with the camera. Like if you don't have all that control, you're never going to get your trades to use your own CRM and learn how to use Matterport cameras with tripods. That's just not going to happen. So we're very fortunate that they're on board and they're benefiting from, you know, not going to site and it's not ready now or, you know, being split amongst three jobs. All the Gantt schedules are centrally controlled. That's my best version of a abbreviated... Yeah. That's the business model. Well, it's cool about that. If I was if I was an investor and living in Alberta, let's say, and I bought a place in Ottawa or Hamilton or wherever, like the need for being there physically is really totally eliminated, and you're going to actually get good feedback versus trying to text whoever and asking for photos and all that sort of back and forth, which is which is what I'm used to traditionally um, managing some of these projects. Right? It's it's a, you can sit in Costa Rica and buy houses up here, and you you get a really good understanding of what's actually happening. Well, then the, the bonus is it sounds like extremely engaging for the client as well, you know, yeah. even more so than it would be if you did have all of the uh, site, ma site managers and salespeople in place, right? Exactly. So. And they, and so I have customers in Nunavut in Japan, like I, I they, whoever they can, they can, they, you know, they have assets in Ontario and they just want to get it done. Um, but yeah, like we, we all communicate with them regularly. There's pre-scheduled meetings. Uh, there's no need to drive around or anything like that. It just doesn't make any sense. So uh, 
what gets you going and what's ex- inspiring for you? I mean, you kind of touched on that with uh, with what you're doing with um, you know the future uh, build and, and affordability and all that. Anything else that's uh, that motivates you and keeps you going? Maybe on a little bit of a personal level, what, what keeps you going, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess so. I explained the business side of things. I think as long as you keep solving problems that that are you know helps helps the, the community, like as simple as it is, that turns into a business, and then you'll be taken care of. And so. I'm not really that worried financially anymore. Um, so that's taken care of. I think at the end of the day, when it comes to personal, you know, I'm going to try to do the best I can do with my career and, and, and my health and my family and friends and people around me. And I, and I hope that that, you know, other younger uh, professionals that kind of inspires them to push and, and, and see through some of these challenges and be consistent and, you know, make their own careers and their own paths. Right. I, I just hope that, you know, if it can inspire, it doesn't matter, a handful, one person to just say, okay, well, guy didn't really have a, an in-depth construction knowledge and he just battled through with seven day work weeks for the first seven, eight years and now six day work weeks. And that persistence and more about that story inspires somebody to just, you know, be as stubborn and, and be patient and push through. I, that's on a personal note, inevitably, probably 10, 15 years from now, that's where my focus will be that you know anything's possible you know and, and if like i said i'm not worried about competitors i'm not worried about new entrants that stuff doesn't matter i welcome it right i just i want everybody to kind of understand what the opportunities are in front of them similar i'm sure to you to you guys and and um just push through mm-hmm. what's up for the future where's uh where's your life and business going well, business, I mean, we're going to continue. We're going to do, continue doing basements, basement apartments, uh, how different housing solutions. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. I mean, from a personal standpoint, um, at some point I need to get married. I think that's like my mom is, uh, it went from like annual conversation to a monthly conversation to uh-huh. weekly, now almost daily. So I'm feeling the pressure. I'm getting up there in age. So I do need to settle down and and probably have a family and all that, but um, you know that'll come. Um, still taking care of myself as uh, we talk about Sandy, and that's important to me as well. Healthy lifestyle. Um, You're a CrossFitter. We got I got two of you CrossFitters on the call here, and a, and a, and an ex CrossFitter and myself. But well, we'll get you maybe back. not maybe not ex for long. I don't know. We'll see. We'll but, get you back. Uh, in. Yeah. No, I mean, there's diet. I'm, I'm researching all kinds of things to try to you know improve longevity and. For anybody who's interested, like I'll tell them about it, but I usually don't bring all that up um, because most people don't want to hear about it. But there's there's so there's so many opportunities as well to improve our our you know healthy active lifestyle and and um, so for a lot of my customers, I'll spend too long you know trying to convince them to do that more so than there's project. But you know it's all part of it, right? It all makes it fun. You you kind of the business evolves to be a part of you, and it's um, I'm very fortunate for that. So like moving to Costa Rica, healthy, active, fun lifestyle, and using Penguin to do basement suites in Ontario, where the best one of the best places is to invest in the in the world. That's that's a good model. You never need to come back to Ontario, really. Oh, thank you, Sandy. You just summed it up perfectly. I yeah. mean, really, what else does anyone want to do with their life? I, I yeah. agree. Just do exactly what Sandy said right there. He just laid it all out for everybody. I think if you've never been to Costa Rica, which I've been there, uh, you have to go. It's an, such an unbelievable place in terms of safety, the community, the weather, the opportunities. Like, I'm as soon as I heard you're down there, Rob. I'm like, of course, it makes makes all the sense in the world. So, I'm glad you're there. Yeah, yeah. It's well. I mean, obviously, it's been life changing, but uh, but just one of those things where it was a a life goal realized, right? So it has been amazing. And uh, again, we're going to talk more about like the investment stuff, obviously, but there's been like a a drastic sort of shift in focus to, you know, family and, uh, and personal goals and that kind of stuff too. But um, the, the, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but next door, they've been working on this house for like, I don't know, uh, like months, and it doesn't seem they start like 6.30 in the morning and it's just all day long. So that's why I've been like muting my mic constantly through the interview. But hopefully they'll be done soon. By but season, yeah, season 12, maybe they'll be done. Yeah. 
<clears throat> exactly. Sounds like but, an opportunity. Uh, no, I mean, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, it, well, I was too late on that opportunity. That's that's something else. I'm always trying to get in on every one of them, but unfortunately, it can't be all of them. Um, uh, but no, I mean, it'd be exciting to uh, see you down here at some point, too. Well, believe me, I'll be on Expedia today. <laughs> all right, we'll have a drink. No problem. Unfortunately, I don't drink, but yes, I'll, we'll have a drink of something. Of something. All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, thanks for sharing all this. I mean, we could have probably talked a lot longer, especially about the business stuff. I mean, I know it's very relatable to, uh, to everyone that's listening most likely. So we'll have you back on and we'll talk a little more in depth even then. So, uh, appreciate your time and thanks for sharing with us today. Um, how can people reach out to you? Um, well, firstly, thank you for having me. It's always fun and I get warmed up and you know, it, it gets, it gets more comfortable as we go. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in terms of reaching out to us, just uh, in every market, just look up penguin basements. And when you call in, uh, Ryan is my uh, administrator. So he takes in all the calls. And if you're interested in doing any work, he'll transfer the call to me or schedule it and we'll help you with your project or chat about CrossFit or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So as simple as that, just, uh, just Google penguin basements. Yes. They'll be able to get in touch with you. That's fantastic. Yeah, BasementsCanada.com. Yep. BasementsCanada.com. Yep. Right on. Okay. And again, guys, that'll be in the show notes, but pretty easy to remember. Uh, if you want to reach out and talk to Guy more, which I'm sure a lot of you do, you, that's the way to do it. Sandy, how can people get in touch with you? Sandy at FreedomRamps.com or um, just look me up on uh, the socials <clears throat> and connect with me there. You can reach me at Rob at MrBreakthrough.ca. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.